So if you can see all the panelists, it's like a competition of who can keep the, the stillest. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, uh, welcome everyone um, to this St. Mary's and, and Leinster <coughs> um, webinar on tactical periodization in rugby. Um, we're really grateful for everyone um, logging on uh, this evening or this morning or this afternoon, depending on, um, on, on where you are in, in, in the world. Um, so thank you for giving up your time to to listen to some great um, uh, guests that we've got in store for you. Um, just some general housekeeping. So if you um, have a look uh, down at your page, there will be a Q&A function. If you can use that for any um, question and answers uh, or questions that you might have throughout the um, webinar, that would be great. Um, try not to use the, the chat function if you can, because that normally gets clogged up a little bit. Um, so if you can use the, uh, the Q&A um, uh, function, that would be brilliant. Um, that will be monitored throughout um, uh, the webinar. So we'll begin to summarize questions or ask, answer questions individually. That will be done um, verbally um, uh, through uh, the webinar, or you may well get a written response from, from one of the the panelists um, so just keep an eye out from that um, and finally um, we'd like to carry the conversation on if you could um, so we've created a hashtag not the most original but hopefully it will work um, it's hashtag tact so that's t-a-c-t periodization with an s rugby um, so if you have any take-home messages from this webinar we'd be extremely grateful for you to, to use that hashtag um, and so we can begin to carry on the conversation beyond this hour or hour and a half that, that we will have um, with you. So that's the boring stuff um, to start with. Um, I'll introduce you to the, the, the panellists. Um, very briefly, guys, if we can go around just introducing ourselves, that would be uh, very much appreciated. So, uh, Mike, could you just introduce yourself? To, uh, yeah. yeah, of course. Um, Mike Ashford, I'm a PhD student at Leeds Beckett University. Um, currently uh, finishing off my PhD, which has been around understanding player decision making, uh, how we how they make decisions, but also how as coaches we can better develop it. Um, and I'm also a rugby coach at Harrogate Rugby Club and uh, Leeds University. Brilliant. Cheers, Mike. Um, Jason, can I hand over to you? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jason T. Uh, my job that pays the bills at the moment is I'm a lecturer in uh, sports studies at Durban University of Technology. Um, I've, I've got a background in coaching. I've been uh, coaching rugby, uh, mostly in, in high schools, youth sports for, for about 15 years. Um, but I, I had the opportunity to, to venture into some university rugby with, uh, with Mike Ashford a few years ago. Um, and I managed to link up with an international sevens side for a little while, which, was, which also added to the experience. Brilliant, Jason. Thank you. Um, Brett? Hi, everyone. My name is Brett. I go, I'm a PhD uh, student as well. I also lecture in the Institute of Technology in Carlo, where I lecture on a master's in sports performance analysis. I'm also the assistant coach of Leinster 18s and UCD's AAL coach. Brilliant, thank you. And Declan, uh, can you introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm, I'm um, Declan O'Brien, coach development manager with Leinster Rugby. Uh, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank the, the guest speakers tonight, the panellists, for putting all this presentation together. And I really look forward to the interaction from everybody online at the moment. It's fantastic. Thanks, Brilliant. guys. Cheers, Declan. Thank you for that. And and finally, from me, um, you probably won't hear from me too much. I'll be uh, overseeing stuff and, and chiving people along. Um, but my name's Michael Ayres. I'm a senior lecturer at St. Mary's University on our um, undergraduate um, and postgraduate programs and our new um, uh, rugby performance masters. Um, and I'm uh, still currently um, at Chelsea Football Club and have been so for the last 15 years, as well as doing some um, research with Leinster. Um, so that provides some context to who we are. We're really fortunate enough and, and the, the sort of stimulus for um, uh, this webinar came from a, a former colleague at Leinster, Derek Mabry, um, who got in contact with, with Jason and Mike after um, they published a paper on tactical periodization. So what, one of the key aims of the webinar today is, is to try and obviously understand some of the theory, but to really put in place some practical solutions to how we might uh, apply the model, whether we are in, in full-time sport or whether we work within a, 
in a club setting. Um, so um, we'll begin. Um, as I said, keep on firing the questions through. Um, we will answer those throughout. We'll also have some time at the end. So, Mike, um, could you kick us off, please? Uh, yeah, by all means. Um, OK, so I'm just going to set the scene, really. Um, the, this first started with me and Jason when we were on a bus on a, on a journey up to uh, Scotland for a game. And we were discussing the idea of tactical periodization and thought, this isn't something that's really been studied or explored in rugby, aside from hearing that it was, it was something that Eddie Jones operationalised. And it, it suddenly became a bit of a brainchild of ours moving forward, both, both theoretically from a research point of view, but also practically in our coaching. And I guess tactical periodization is very much, uh, to use a Steve Coveyism, it, it, it's an attempt to start with the end in mind. Uh, and what I mean by that is, how are we going to play the game and how can we get to that point? And that would be the easiest way I'd describe tactical periodization. And I've just included a number of quotes here that best capture it and conceptualize it. So the first is what is tactically desirable must be technically possible from Launder. And it pretty much implies that if we have a tactical aim or vision or outcome, then physic the physical, technical and psychological need to equate to that. And as with our quote from our paper there, any physical or technical action has a tactical intention. So pretty much tactical periodization isn't a rigid approach. The approach is very much dictated by a way of playing the game that is born from the coaches and the players that you have. So there is a, a huge amount of flexibility. And I think that is something that we're really going to try and hit home as, as we look to work from the bottom up here, that there is a flexibility to this approach. Brett, could we move on to the next slide, please? Okay, so realistically, the starting point comes with this idea of simplifying complexity. And as I said before, starting with the end in mind. So what is the vision of performance? And to, to use another one of my colleagues, uh, Sergio Laura Bertial, uh, they conducted a study on serial winning coaches across multiple sports and identified that the best, and by best, uh, Pep Guardiola didn't meet the criteria for this study. Uh, he wasn't deemed good enough to be included in the study. So that gives you an indication what they meant by serial winning coaches. And they pretty much identified that two, two key characteristics of serial winning coaches are the ability, one, to simplify the complexities of the game they work within, and two, that they have vision ahead of what's going on in the game at present. So they're, they're able to predict thing like, things like rule changes or tactical modifications in the game. And a real simple way to start with this is to truly understand the moments of the game from a tactical periodization perspective, which from a rugby perspective, uh, could we... Uh, next slide, please, Brett, if that's okay. Thank you. So I break down the game into three different areas here. So these three things are all much of a muchness. So game moments, principles of play and performance problems are three different ways of saying exactly the same thing. This is the constant. So with every game, with every invasion game, you have a set of rules and you have a preliminary goal. So the preliminary goal in rugby union is to score more points than your opponent. OK, simple. And the rules then prohibit certain means in order to achieve that. And this, these game moments, principles of player performance problems are what are then born, born from, those, from that interaction between the rules and the preliminary goal. So you can go either way. You can start with game moments or performance problems or principles of play. Now, in my perspective, I like to use performance problems. And the reason why is because for every problem that the rules present, such as, right, we've got to penetrate and score or progress the ball. We, we as a team, as a collective, need to come up with a, with a solution to that, a tactical solution that then guides technical, physical, and psychological characteristics that are then demanded. And just by simply coming up with moments, principles, or performance problems, we capture what is an inherently complex game into six or seven components. Next slide, please, Brett. So I think the first stage after this is to then use those principles, moments, or performance problems to then start to consider 
what the ideal vision of performance looks like for each one of those tactical solutions. And I put there on the grass. So what, what would this look like? What does that vision look like for each solution? So how are we going to penetrate and score? How are we going to progress the ball? Or how are we going to win the ball back when we're defending? And then we start to consider what Pam Richards and Dave Collins would call an alpha version. So the ultimate vision of performance. But then we have to take into account the idea that we have a set number of players already that we're working with who possess a, uh, an amount of capabilities. And we have to take into, that, into account those capabilities when considering the tactical solutions we're going to use. And then we also can consider if we're working in a developmental perspective or developmental context, well, we might set those solutions a year ahead. So in other words, what, where can we get them to? And then we start to shape a beta version, again, using Pam Richards and Dave Collins' work. So we start to shape the tactical solutions through, through the minds of the players. So to use a Victor Freig quote there, the solution should be born in the player's mind first. And that's not to say that the solution should be dictated by the players themselves. They should simply be created with a knowledge and a clear understanding of what the players can already do. And from there, you can start to consider, with these tactical solutions, a common language that is mutually understood between coaches and players and support staff alike. So, at the so pretty much what we're getting into there is we have these tactical solutions that then start to form a way of playing. And from there, you can start to consider as a coach, right, we have this way of playing, these ideal solutions. Now we can start to consider the capabilities that need to be nurtured or developed. Can we move on to the next slide, please, Brett? Thank you. So then we can start to also consider, we've got the capabilities that need to be developed, but we need to understand the context in which those capabilities need to be operationalized. So at any level, with any context you're working in, there is going to be a certain level of match demand or game demand. And these, again, are going to be technical, physical, psychological. So with that, we can start to align the capability that needs to be developed within training to the make game demands to better prepare our players for the demands of the game come a Saturday or a Wednesday afternoon. Next slide, please, Brett. And just to finish off on this introduction, from these game demands, we, we can start to consider how how we influence the physical, the technical, the psychological elements in training throughout the week. And I use uh, something that my colleague Chris Lowe first introduced me to from uh, gymnastics, which was uh, from the Eastern Bloc, actually, the USSR, back in the 80s. And they talked about this idea of surplus, where gymnasts would repeat uh, routines over and over again in one go, so that when it came to competition, it would be simple. And from there, I kind of came up with these slider, this slider analogy where if we have a mean understanding or an average understanding of the game demands, we can slide the physical, technical and tactical up and down to better prepare the players for competition throughout the week. Um, <clears throat> evening, folks. Um... I'm going to take you through the game demands that, that Mike just talked about um, to, for the players and for the coaches to better understand what the game is about. And I believe that the coaches and the players need to know what the game is actually about. So looking at the adult game and the age grade game, most of this data is taken from World Rugby Six Nations and the analysis department in Leinster. The game is around 60% unstructured play, um, which means unstructured is uh, from turnover, from, um, from the opposition kicking you the ball, and um, that's sort of not planned for chaos um, sort of game. Whereas 40% is in around that structured where it comes from lineouts and scrums. With that in mind, the attack roughly has about 51 possessions in the whole game. So that's 51 times that they can actually attack from. For the schoolboy game, it's 70 minutes or it's 10 minutes shorter. Um, they have about 42 possessions in total. For the set pieces, lineouts and scrums, the scrums, there's only eight scrums in the adult game. 
Um, now they can plus and minus. Sometimes it's lower, sometimes it's higher because of the nature of the game. For the schoolboy game, it's 11. And for the women's game, it's nine. Uh, line outs, 11 for the adult game, eight for, um, for the schoolboy game and seven for the women's game. So you can see the, the beginning, that sort of information for a coach can, can begin to form what training is about or how you should start tru- um, structuring training. The most common activity is in around that contact area. So the rucks per game is between 80 to 100 rucks per game for the adults, 75 to 90 for a schoolboy. Women's game has a lot more rucks. There's a lot more tackles. I'll show you the, the, the defense side of things in a second. But they have a, about 120 rucks um, per game. I spoke about unstructured play. Um, in the transition attack to defense, roughly you're looking at about 22 times the opposition is going to kick you the ball, depending on the game, and 15 um, from turnovers um, where the opposition have either knocked the ball on or you've won the ball in the tackle area. So a majority of our possessions are coming from that, that transition from attack to defense. Um, in terms of tries scored, um, again, most of the tries in all, all grades in the women's game, in the under-18 age, age grade game and the, the senior adult game, majority is coming from transition play, such as those kicks and turnovers that we spoke about. Um, less than 35% is coming from scrums or from lineouts. So the rest is made up of either quick taps or scrum attack, that sort of area. Um, 60% of all tries are scored within the first four phases for the schoolboy game. And this data is, is presented all around the world and it's, it's more or less the same per game for the men's and women's game. In terms of defense, roughly you'll have 40 times you'll have to, or sorry, 49 times you'll have to defend. The school game is, is 40. In terms of tackles, the average game is around 106 tackles. For the schoolboy game, it's sitting at around 78. The women's game, and this data is taken from this year's Six Nations, is very, very high. It's, it's double what the schoolboys are, are, are producing at the moment. So there's around 150 to 170 tackles. And um, one of their games, one of the teams had over 200 tackles in the game. And then lastly, the transition is 20 from kicks and, and turnover. So you've got to try and defend once you kick the ball or you've got to try and defend after you turn over the ball. So all of that information should start to formulate in your, in your head what training is going to be about. Brett, can yeah. I ask, ask a question? We've had a couple of questions yeah. through. So I just thought, um, are there any sort of the sources um, of that data at all? Are there any references that we can guide um, people to? Yeah, I'll, I'll send on all the, all the references. The references are bottom left hand of the screen. Hopefully people okay. can see it. Right. Um, that unstructured, structured attack comes from John McKee and, and Donna O'Connor down in Australia, which is, uh, which is based on super rugby. Um, the rest is all available in the World Rugby site, the World Rugby Analysis site. But I can definitely forward on after this with the presentation, right. all of these papers. No, no problem with that. Excellent. Thank you. Um, then looking at in terms of training, uh, Paddy Phillips is a, is a fitness advisor within Leinster. Um, he studied in Leeds Beckett. He's a PhD. Um, he looked into the exposure of match play preparation in the adolescent schoolboy and academy game. He tried to compare the, both of them. What his findings were, were schoolboy backs were underprepared for all movement demands. So they were unprepared for the volume of work, the speeds, um, the walking, the running, the sprinting, the jogging. Um, for the forwards, they were underprepared for the low intensity activities. However, looking at the academy forwards, uh, that, that he, he looked at for his study, they were exposed to similar physical demands for training to matches and their backs were similar or if not exceeding the values. So the value of probably more experienced coaches working in that, that academy setting than the schoolboy setting were, were be able to, or was able to match the intensities of, of each game. Um, Jason? Yeah, thanks, Brett. Um, so just to follow on from what you were saying there and to, to share with everyone watching and listening out there, those, um, those results from, uh, from Paddy's research are, aren't, uh, a, they are very typical. Wherever we look at, um, at the training demands, we find that we are struggling to simulate match intensity in training, um, which is a problem because most of us are um, time poor in our environments. So we don't 
don't have as much time as we'd we'd potentially want with our our players and and there's there's a lot of things we want to do we want to get fit we want to get better at our skills we want to execute our tactical plays better um and so so that that causes problems and you know part of the reason why um maybe we're sharing the ideas around tactical periodization is that um to some extent we think that this that this is an approach that can help with that time poorness so think think back to the previous slide where Brett showed you that um that there that in some environments it's difficult to simulate the demands of training and then um what this is is this is some unpublished data from a, from an international sevens team um and essentially the um the red the red bar is match demands and these are peak peak demands so it's um if you had a look at the the most uh, challenging 30 seconds in the game you can see that that's sitting somewhere at around 220 meters a minute if you had a look at the most challenging 3 minutes in the game you can see that's around 120 meters a minute and then what we've got laid on top of that is a couple of different training types that that are based on the tactical periodization uh you know approach and and what you can see from this is that we are either either completely replicating match demands in terms of distance run or we are in fact overloading and and exceeding we're creating that sort of surplus that uh that Mike talked about um so this particular slide is just a, a very rough metric it's looking at total distance but Brett if you jump across to the next one um what you see here is we we're now looking at at a couple of different metrics so um for anyone who's who's not too familiar with this type of forest plot the um the gray bar in the middle essentially rep represents match demands if any dot occurs within that gray bar it means that it's it's replicating the ma match demands give or take a little bit and what you can see um just working from left to right is that the volume and the the quality or the intensity type training are very very good at at replicating match demands um and then towards the right hand side of the screen what what we're showing there is that by by changing the session constraints somewhat sometimes you can overemphasize some things you can create surplus or overload in some areas um but that often has the the effect of reducing the load in in other areas so for example the the third one across is a a uh, training session focused on maximum velocity and and high speed running and you can see that uh, that's right at the top of of the match demands but as a result of focus on that we we've got in less acceleration or distance or um or tackles in that session and then then the uh the one on the far right hand side is just showing us that if we do a a tech a session focused on collisions or tackling we very lightly to sim simulate the collision demands of the game but then you know right at the bottom there we've we've not uh, created any maximum speed stimulus so it's really just uh, to paint a picture about how we can um, start thinking about manipulating variables within training while we're uh, while we're practicing our tactical skill to try and get to closer to some of those physical demands that uh, that we're trying to to prepare the players for Michael any any questions at this stage Uh yeah no it's just one that's come through from Liam Dunset and Liam thank you for it's a really good one to um sort of uh interject with um so when we're looking at the opposition average so from whistle to wish whistle duration and then trying to replicate that in training so are are we looking at any overload in terms of time duration so for example 60 seconds so we actually need to train for 72 second blocks is it simple enough to add 20% extra time into into how we uh into the duration in terms of 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 our coaching um i'll uh i'll have a go at answering that if that's all right michael yep. um so you know i think that um myself personally i probably wouldn't get too hung up on what the um what the opposition are able to do because at the end of the day what we're talking about is um physiological systems that underpin these these physical performances so you know if you if you're going to go all out for 72 seconds we know that that's going to be um you know an an atp pc system followed by followed by the anaerobic system and and a big aerobic contribution and i mean without getting too technical 
those systems can't tell the difference between 60 and 72 seconds. Um, operationally, what, what happens when I'm, I'm training like this is uh, we'd have an idea about what sort of stimulus we, we're going for. We'd, we'd know that uh, you know, on, on average, the ball in, is in play maybe 30 or 40 seconds, um, but we'll know also that at times it, ex is, it exceeds that. So generally, um, we'd start with the plan in mind and say, okay, if, if this is a quality focused session, then we then we're going to work towards those those smaller uh, time periods, but we'll see how it evolves. Because you know, when we when we're working with humans, sometimes we we're planning for a for a play to carry on for forty five seconds, and they drop it on the second pass. Um, and then and then it's about you know thinking on your feet a little bit. If it, if you want to get that stimulus, then you then you move to what Brett was saying about the unstructured play and you you throw a ball out and or you kick a ball or, or something and and you just keep the ball in play you just keep people people reacting and and doing things um and also you know what i'd also do is even within a session where we know that we we may be working on the on the shorter time periods in the scale we might throw a long one out there just you know because people have got to be able to react they've got to be able to to adapt in in the game it's no good they switch off after 30 or 45 seconds um, so Liam, I, I, I don't know if that's, that's answered your question. I, I hope I haven't missed the point, but, um, yeah, for me, I'd, I'd be working to, towards, um, what I, I feel my team needs to be stimulated by, not by, not by the averages produced by other teams. Thanks. Uh, Thanks. Yeah, for I think we're going to jump in and hopefully some of this might answer Liam's question. If we take that the match duration is 80 minutes for the adult game and for the for the underage game it is it is 70 minutes obviously the actual ball in play time is actually only 37 minutes so for half of that time or less than half of that time the ball is actually on the pitch so there's an awful lot of downtime for, for that's going on between the game of that 37 minutes you're only ever in attack roughly 17 minutes in defense roughly 15 if you're having a really bad day, that 15 minutes in defense is nearly 20. And in terms of attack is actually much lower. You might only have the ball for, for, for nine or 10 minutes. So that data changes as we go along, um, depending on what type of game is going on. The average passage of play is less than, six, than 30 seconds. Now, with the nature of our game, we don't have a definitive end point. The end point is based around the skills of the player and the understanding of referees and our understanding of laws. We, we can't say that a passage of play is going to go on for longer and longer. Um, Gillian Reardon, who works in the senior team in Leinster, has done studies on what he terms the worst case scenario. So the worst case scenario is the longest passage of play that the ball is, is, is on the pitch for. And he's looking at about 152 seconds, which is over, over two minutes, um, up to 171 seconds. Actually, the 171 seconds is, is my research from, from referees around the around the All-Ireland League. And so we've got to prepare our players for all of these situations, whether it be averages of 30 seconds or right up to that worst case scenario of 152 to 171 seconds. But I think you've got to interlink that with your training sessions. I, I, I don't believe you should just go with six, 30 seconds because that's the average because you might have to hold on to the ball for a hell of a lot longer than that. Um, in terms of running demands, um, I know we, we spoke about the physical nature of the game. For an 80-minute game, roughly the high-end players are covering around 7 kilometers, so 7,000 meters, and it can drop down to about 5.5. Five. For the schoolboy and the, and the, and the uh, women's game, it's around 5K, so 5,000 meters. Um, university games are slightly less, according to the, the research coming out of Leeds Beckett. Um, one, one metric we look at is relative distance. So that's the amount of, of meters you cover within a minute. So the average game is sitting at around um, plus or minus 7.6. It's sitting at around seven or 69 meters per minute. Obviously, the age grade game drops to 65. Women's game is sitting at 50, 54. And again, I can forward on some of these, uh, these studies at the end with the, with the presentation. If you, if you want, the references are down on the bottom left-hand side. So this is what's going on in terms of the physical nature of the game. In terms of the tactical, technical points of the game, the adult game, 
ball carries mm. are nine plus or minus eight. And for the schoolboy game, it's six. So that's six times they're carrying the ball into contact. The ruck involvements, so whether it be taking the ball into contact and clearing out rucks, is sitting at around 26 times. And for the schoolboy game, it's it's 14. Tackles, nine for the for the um for the adult game and six for the schoolboy game. With that data, that's whole team averages. So we got to remember our forwards will probably carry more and the backs less. The, the, the rook involvements for a forward is greater than a back and the tackles because they're a bit, they're closer to the contact areas. So that, that data is there for the adult or for the age grade game. It is actually just lower because they're playing the game 10 minutes less. So it's looking at seven, uh, seven rook or ball carries, rook involvements about 18 and tackles is around six. Looking at the speed and all this data is telling us that our game is just, it's an intermittent sport. There's bouts of high intensity, low intensity, high speeds, low in speed. But 72 to 81% of our game is actually low and low activity. So it's walking. Now, this is not ball and play time. This is over the duration of 80 minutes. So if you actually stop and think about it, when the forwards are winning a line out, the outside backs are, are repositioning. And most of the time it's walking. In terms of the, the passages play in between the passages or the ball and play time, they are walking to the line of walking to the scrum. Um, low, low speed running, jogging roughly takes up about 18% of our game. High speed running is about 2%. And depending on the position, sprinting, um, an outside back is only sprinting uh, one sprint every, every seven minutes. And for the forward, it's actually double that. It's about 14 and I know that's that's some of Jason's research. So I'd say you wouldn't mind sharing that with the slides, Jason. No, sure, no problem. Okay. Uh, moving on to the actual passage of play. So we go back to the game averages of that thirty seconds. Roughly, the relative distance is is around one hundred and eight. Collisions is sitting at one, and the accelerations over three meters per second is sitting at about one. High speed running is about fifteen meters. If we look at the averages, so that's 60 to 90 seconds, the relative distance is similar to, to what the 30 to 60 second game is. Accelerations, they will have one extra acceleration and they'll do one more collision. In the worst case scenario, what Killian is saying, everything, all the metrics go up. Um, the total distance covered is around 300 meters. Accelerations are around, or go to two. Collisions goes up to one. High speed running is a lot more. So once the ball is in play, um, th those metrics start to go up. And I know this is physical data, but we as coaches have got to have this understanding for this sort of information because this will then help to design our training sessions. Brett, um, yep. that, that, uh, that's great. I think you provided a rationale, a really clear rationale of why we understand that. Um, just some of the questions that have come in have been focused around that, particularly around, well, um, I guess there's an argument whereby, well, if if the ball is not in play for that long, should we be trying to be develop more skillful players who who, who don't lose the ball? Um, uh, but and I guess a, a question from Jonathan Sharkey, I think summarises it quite well when he talks about um, a club coach at an am amateur level. Should they be focused on the physical demands for the majority of the session due to the lack of training time? Um, with, with the players that they have each week and a focus on individual skills when fatigue has been introduced. So you, I guess we try and then create a more of a positive adaption after the training session or the physical work has been, uh, has been done, so to speak. Uh, what, what are the panelists' thoughts on that? Uh, I think for me, like to adopt a true tactical periodization approach, it, the attempt is to try and target all three of those is to is to try and work under fatigue whilst developing skill and diverse, developing physical ability under a tactical framework obviously that sounds very idealistic but that is the approach that we're trying to get across here is that if we can better plan and shape our intentions around the capabilities that we need for the game then hopefully all of those capabilities are going to improve jason brett i don't know if you got yeah. anything to add to that yeah Absolutely. I think, yeah, th this is the idea. We, we're trying to, to do all of these things at, at once because 
you know, we, we get taught about sport in silos, but it doesn't work like that. We can't run a rugby practice where, you know, you go first to the strength and conditioning coach and you run around the field a bunch of times. Then you go to the skills coach and you, you practice passing. Then you go to the head coach and he draws some stuff on the board so that you understand your tactics. And then you, you go, go to the mental coach and he tells you how to deal with pressure. It doesn't work like that. So what we've got to do is, is we've got to, we got to understand that at the end of the day, you win by playing better than the opposition. Okay. You win by executing your skills and your tactics better than the opposition under pressure. And, you know, for me as a strength and conditioning coach, that's uh, quite a tough realization to, to come to because what you're saying is that what you do is important, but it's actually not that important because, you know, I've coached plenty of guys that are, are awful in the gym, uh, but they're incredible rugby players and, and they make a difference on the pitch. Um, and if you, if you bring across the, this physical Adonis that you know, can't, can't play or can't combine with the rest of the players, it really doesn't matter that much. Um, so that, that's where the, the tactical periodization idea of the, the tactical outcomes being chief and everything fitting in b- below that to support that becomes, becomes the most important. Um, and just, you know, I'm, I'm off on a bit of a tangent here, but, you know, I mentioned earlier that everyone's time poor. Now, if you're as, as a strength and conditioning coach sitting there and, and your team try, trains twice a week and you're trying to get them fit and you're, and you're begging for time from the coach and you're saying, oh, but yo, coach, you, got to, you only gave me 15 minutes and I need 20. You know, you're never gonna, you're never gonna make a major change to the guy's uh, you know, performance outcomes like that. But if you're sitting down with the coach and saying, okay, coach, what do we need to do this week? What, what's the tactical outcome that you need? And he goes, well, you know, we, we got to get, get better at our defense on the, on the short side. And you go, okay, coach, why don't we set up the session like this? Because we can, we can achieve that tactical goal of defending on the short side, but we can also get some really great physical stimulus in there by, by manipulating a couple of things, whether that's space or time or, or whatever it is. That, then we start creating a partnership and the players benefit. Brilliant. Thank you for for that. Um, I think that's that's probably answered a, f- a few questions. Sorry, Brett. Uh, yeah, the inter- yeah, no, you're fine. I, and hopefully the the slides in in the next while when, yeah. when we when we go through the actual practical, yeah. what does the training session look like? Yeah. Um, hopefully that will answer Jonathan's question and and other questions out there. Yeah. Just to sort of, sort of um, just to pre uh, Mike, Brett, and Jason, there'll be some questions coming through around RPEs and how we might integrate those uh, if we obviously haven't got access to some GPS. Okay, um, looking at, at, at how, how we're going to practically train uh, tactical periodization for, for rugby sessions, what, what Jason and Mike have proposed uh, within their research is looking at four different types of training sessions. So the first training session, uh, and we have video to show what these, what these sessions look like, is a non-contact work capacity session. Uh, and I'll go through the, the, the information on, on these tra- sessions and the training goals of these sessions as we go along. The second session is a contact acceleration deceleration session. So it, it's, it's a lot more contact based. And then there's the speed session. When you use the word speed session straight away, the people will think it's a fitness session. It's not, it's, it's the speed of the session and the speed of movement of your players um, where they're actually working their tactical, technical, and and physical and mental part of the game. And the last session is an active recovery session. So what do those sessions look like? So with the non-contact work capacity session, the training goal is to develop endurance capacity. So running intensities and volumes are greater than the match play. So the information that we've already presented on match play, we're looking to to override that and, and, and increase that volume. With this particular session, there's no contact. Um, it's going to be in a large group, so 10 versus 10, 15 versus 15. You can overload the attack, overload the defense, whatever way you're going to do it. Um, playing area, mid-pitch, full-size pitch. The interval time is between 20 and 30 minutes with a, with a complete recovery or an eight to, or five to eight minute recovery, which will be around the complete recovery. Intervals, one, numbers of sets, uh, one and three. Jason, have you got anything to add on, on that one? Uh, no, I think you've, okay. you've summed it up well. Thank you. 
Okay, sorry. I am, I am aware I'm presenting some of your, an awful lot of your work. So what do those sessions look like? Um, so what we're going to do is we're just going to look at, at about two minutes of video footage taken from, I think, Sensor Under 19s. So this, this session is looking at transition defense to attack. Um, the mental part of it is decision making under fatigue, concentration. We're looking at high relative distance. So the relative distance should be around the 100 meter mark. We're looking at kick chase, tactical, technical, and the repositioning of, of the team once they go from defense to attack. Oh, sorry, it's gone without playing the video. Okay, so the game starts with a box kick. Okay, so instantly you can see a transition coming. Okay, now we have a second transition. So they've actually ended up getting the ball back. Okay, so turnover. You notice that a turnover happens, the game doesn't stop. So the coach has actually just uh, reloaded rooks on either side of just outside the 22s. Um, so all that's designed to do is to keep that relative distance high. Again, working on that mental capacity of, of, of trying to fatigue the players. Again, because the, this particular activity is working on transition defense to attack, here's the transition going in. So there is a constraint for this particular activity because it's what they were trying to work on. So the transition comes in. Okay, kick to the corner. Instead of playing the line out, players are going to go the other opposite side of the field. So again, this is to keep that physical nature of, of the game. Uh, keep it high. And again, the game is going to start with all this, with this transition defense to attack in mind. Okay, there's another error here. It's kicked out on the full, but again, the game doesn't stop. We want the players um, to overload the physical part of, of, of the meters covered within that second, within this session. So we just, we're keeping the players moving all the time. The second um, session that, that's been proposed but, during time. Uh, Rick, sorry. If, if I could just jump yeah. in with a, um, a quick comment there. Um, uh, just, uh, you were talking about those worst case scenarios, um, the longest ball in play time and things like that. Um, and what that type of session that you just showed there is particularly useful for is preparing people for, for those. Now, we know they don't happen often that those numbers that you showed are based on uh, the longest passage of play in a game. But if you do a training session like what, what you've just done and you've carried that on for, for 20 minutes or 30 minutes, you will, you know, guys will be more than conditioned to be able to deal with those worst case passages of play. Um, the second session that's been put out is a contact acceleration deceleration session. So this session um, is high density contact. There's a lot more tackles, a lot more rooks. Um, there's still acceleration and deceleration parts of the game. So this is to try and replicate this contact area. Um, the group size is smaller. Playing area is small because we do want them to have contact. The interval time is 60 to 120 seconds. So in around that two minute with about a one minute recovery. So we're trying to match that above average um, part of the game. So what does this look like? So this is taken from the Leinster Schools team. So it is a defense session. So we are looking at defense. There is a transition um, involved because we've, le we've left it quite live. Um, the mental parts of the game, we're looking at their decision-making. We have a bit of a call saying, get the ball back. So we're looking at, at this here. High contact content, the tactical technical is pressure on the attack by a line speed. We're also looking at a two-man tackle to try and slow the ball down. So what does that look like? So we have three teams. Um, the constraint is the ball carrier must take contact straight away. Okay, so there's a transition. Okay, passage of play is around 27 seconds. However, we just try and keep them moving with and giving them around a 30 second break on that one.
So it's a pretty condensed area they're playing in. We don't let them go to full field because we actually do want to put them through that contract situations. And this is probably one of our first training sessions of the, of, of the season. Brett, can I just jump in here if that's okay? Yeah. Um, this is just a real nice example where you can reattach to, to that launder quote, which is what is tactically desirable must be technically possible. Um, for every tactical attempt here of a two-man tackle or a turnover, there, there has to be an efficient technique reinforced in there. And that's really where little moments of feedback can be pushed in from the coach as this is going along. And because it is so intermittent in the in the nature of this, so 30 seconds off, you've got plenty and ample opportunity to to be engaging and feeding back with your coach behaviours. I just think it's a nice example there. Yeah. So you can see they're the, they're the four areas that we're trying to work on with the players, and it is within one activity. Um, so you can see, you can start begin you can begin to see see tactical periodization and the and the model that's been put forward by by Jason and Mike here. Um, the third session is the speed session. So we're, we're looking at the, the game with a, a higher amount of speed and it's speed of decision-making, speed of movement and tactical ex execution. Um, there is some contact involved, but not, not a whole lot because we would have done the contact in that last session. Um, group size, um, 10 versus 7. So there is an overload of attack and defense. Medium pitch. Interval times are dropped, so they're sitting at around 30 30 seconds to 60 seconds recoveries um, should be quite high. So we want them all the time to, to think of, of, of keeping the game nice and high. So this is another transition defense to attack. So we're working on this. Physical part is the accelerations, decelerations. Mental goes decision-making concentration again. Um, there's a kick chase defense nature to tactical technical. And there's a reposition of, of the team in attack and defense. So this one here, smaller area than before. So the intensity of this particular game is a lot higher than the last one. We let them play through the transition even if there's, there's errors. Okay, so now there's time they stop. This is their recovery time. So there's a bit of a chat with the coaches. Um, they can have a discussion. Then we go straight back in once we, we finish with that 60-second that, uh, break. So again, because this, this particular session is transition defense to attack, there's the transition. There's low contact. So it's more of a grab and hold. So again, you can see the four areas that we're trying to work on within that training session. Um, the last training session is an active recovery session. So it's, um, it's similar to a match intensity, but it is probably quite low. Most people would maybe run their team sessions or their team run sessions, their last session before a match, similar to this. So again, a shorter period of time. It is a larger group because we want 15 versus eight. So that might be your start to 15 versus your eight, eight, eight substitutes. Um, medium size to large side game interval time we'll keep it at two and three recovery 60 seconds intervals quite low so what does that look like um, so this is an attack versus defense below match intensity uh, we are looking at decision making uh, passing and support uh, and we're trying to get the players to hold some width here on this one So we start with just those four rook pads across. So that's what they're, that's their point of start.
again, there's limited contact within it. If it's if it's pre-game, it's more of a grab and hold sort of activity. So that's roughly the activity that we would do for that sort of part of part part of the training week. Right. Um, yep. I, I, first of all, I'd really like to say thank you for to sharing those um, clips with us because they're not many clubs would, uh, particularly within soccer, would would do that. So thank you for sharing um, and giving us that insight and some really um, there's some really good practical examples to take away that that. Um, I give, again, provides a justification for what we're talking about. Um, we've, we've had loads of questions coming in. Um, some we'll deal with around the mental side of the game and RPEs maybe later on as we work our way through. Um, so a few questions have come in around um, sort of uh, also around coaches' knowledge and understanding and the type of coach and the, the experience learning experiences they need in, in terms of implementing this model. And again, maybe we can, we'll finish with those. But I guess um, th when we're using this tactical periodization approach, I guess it does align, ourselves, uh, align itself um, fairly uh, succinctly with maybe teaching games for understanding or, or constraints-led approach using some of those principles of representation. Um, be good to get your thoughts on, on that, Mike, Brett and Jason. Yeah, I guess um, I guess I'll jump in here. Really, um, I guess this kind of, kind of an, aligns to my PhD research around the idea of what representation actually looks like, representative practice design. Um, I think I think the moments of the game, or the principles of the game, or problems, as I said earlier, give you an attempt to what uh, to understand what representative should look like. So sometimes representativeness can just be understood as a, a whole game. So we're just going to play the game. Whereas from my perspective, we should be trying to represent the particular moment of the game that we're targeting. So if we're trying to uh, work on line breaks through the center of the pitch, then so off a fly half, we want to really reinforce that moment over and over again. So we then design our practice to make sure that the, that decision, that moment is frequently repetitive. And that might be in a single phase in a game or through multi-phase. So I think representativeness is very much particular to the demand of the moment of the game rather than the game as a whole. Okay, brilliant. Cheers that, Mike. Anything you'd like to add on to that, Brett or Jason? On, Jay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, look, this is Mike's the the expert in in this area, and I, I think he's he's summed it up quite well. <laughs> not my, not a great deal I can add to that. Um, and Brett, just a question for you, I think, yeah. from Nick Hill. Um, in terms of those video that you showed, yeah. what were the principles of play that they were working on in each of those examples? Um, were they just fitting the data into? Were they were just were those examples to to fit the um, to represent yeah. the data you were showing. Yeah, the, by the way. yeah that, those, um, those video clips were used to fit what those training sessions looked like. Okay. So for example, if we take that, that um, defensive session and that, um, that which was an answer under 18 session, we would have done something similar to that training session, Andy Skeen and myself for, for our first year in charge of the team. And um, we put the GPS vests on the players and we found out that that particular activity that we were doing was nowhere near what what was needed for the, for a particular match for for matches, so we ended up tweaking that the players had to run a bit more, and we had to increase the contact by saying, well, the first ball carry had to be a contact, even though our philosophy wouldn't be that. So we had to try and try and come up with an activity that would match the actual what was actually going on in the game, and then we'd we'd roll it back. So so they originally started in the middle of the pitch, but then we we started them on the side. So so it, it's probably a good example of us using our knowledge, our rugby knowledge, to actually match what the fitness guys were telling us. And, and we, we had to tweak our training because of it. Yeah, I, th I think that's a, a great point, Brett, because I think in its simplest form, you know, this can be mis misinterpreted as, oh, well, this is just game-based training. You know, we'll, uh, we'll just play games all the time. Um, 
and yeah, we we want people, players in games all the time, but we want them in very particular situations within the game so that they can be have the opportunity to execute the skills and make the decisions that that they're going to be ex- afforded in the game so that they can do those better when those opportunities present themselves. It's it, it's not random. It's uh, in fact, there's a lot of thought that goes into trying to to make it as similar to those game situations as possible. Brilliant. Thank you, Jason. Um, j- just uh, we, we're just going to pause very quickly for a water break um, just to provide some sort of context uh, in the UK um, every Thursday evening. Um, people are um, going outside onto their um, uh, onto the roads, not on physically onto the roads, but onto the pavements uh, or at their front door to clap for the NHS. So um, those of you who, who wish to do that um, uh, will give you two minutes. Um, I also probably suggest it's a good time to, to grab a glass of water um, and come back. We've got um, probably around about 15, 20 minutes left with some plus questions and answers. So um, we'll break for two minutes now and we'll see you at two minutes past eight. Okay, well, um, welcome back, everyone. I um, uh, hope you managed to grab a cup of tea and stretch the legs. I definitely know after these uh, sort of two months uh, of, of lockdown in the UK, I'm, I'm going to need a new a new back um, and hips after this. So if anyone knows a, a good surgeon, um, if they could send me their, his, his or her details, that would be much appreciated. Um, just to sort of summarise some of the questions that have, that have come in, um, we'll, we will be talking about um, the vertical and horizontal training weeks uh, um, in a few moments, so we'll, we'll, we'll cover those. Um, and there'll be work that, that Mike and Jason have done in that in that area. Um, there's a question here from Stephen Phillips, so, and, and I, I, I must admit I don't know the answer to this, but. Um, uh, how does the, the, this approach um, compare or, or, or differ to the tactical morpho cycle described by uh, Fergus Connolly in Game Changer? I don't know if any of you guys have come come across that. Is that one stumped us? Yeah, I, I, I've started reading Game Changer. I'm afraid I'm I'm not there yet. Okay, okay. So apologies, Stephen, for not being able to uh, to uh, answer that one. Um, and there's some more coming in, um, definitely around the maybe the amateur and grassroots game and how we can again embed this approach in in um, in that setting. So we'll pick that up as well as the embedding sort of psychological skills and coach knowledge towards the end. Um, so I'll hand back to to you guys um, to to continue if that's okay. Yeah, I, I'm just going to look about what does this look like on a, on a on a training week. Um, yeah. The majority of the research around this area is in Portuguese. Um, and the translations for this research 
get a bit blurred in translation. So what I speak about is the principle of horizontal alteration and specificity. Um, however, it is essentially the weekly schedule. What does it actually look like for us? Um, so to, to quote Jason, um, training activities to, to emphasize the development of different physical and tactical abilities throughout the training week. So what the training week is going to look, look like is have we actually touched on that physical, on that tactical, the, the abilities, does it actually touch? We, we believe these sessions do. So the weekly schedule, if we take it um, that we go match to match, Saturday to Saturday, um, and we had four training sessions for that particular week. Now, straight away, people are going to say, well, we only train Tuesday, Thursday. We do have a model for that coming up next. But for the school teams out there, the higher end schools, they are probably training four times a week. So what it looks like for a Sunday is complete rest. The players, because we, we play a contact sport, they've got to have their recovery time. And it's not only the physical recovery, it's actually the mental recovery of a game as well. So, so we go with complete rest. Um, the second or the Monday, which is going to be the first day of the week, um, a sort of um, activity will be that sub maximum work capacity that we just showed. So it's, it's that capacity where the ball is in play longer. There's a lot more running, but the, the running is, is lower intensity. There's no contact and it's designed like that because of the physical nature of what went on 48 hours beforehand. Moving into the Tuesday part of the session will be the acceleration, deceleration contact set part of part of the, of the week. Um, so that was a time where we can start to ramp up the activity where the players should be recovered, that they can start that, that um, physical nature of the game. Wednesday goes to complete rest. Again, we are recovering from what went on on Tuesday. So we're looking at a 24-hour rest, rest period there. Moving into Thursday will be where that speed session will come in. So after a time of rest where the players hopefully will have, will have recovered, Friday, we're into that act active recovery phase where they are recovering from the training load of the week, but they're also preparing for what's happening the following day, which is the, which is the match. And then we'll work on that cycle again. Um, Jason, anything on, on that particular one? Um, yeah, probably just to um, also address some of, some of the questions I, I see coming through. You know, one of the biggest challenges with training rugby players is this necessity to engage in contact and collisions in the game. Now, we have to do it in training because if we, if we don't do it in training, we're never prepared for, for doing it in matches and there's no opportunity to improve our skill or our technique in, as, in that aspect of the game. So there's got to be a contact exposure during the week. What we also know is that that contact exposure is particularly damaging and it takes time to, to recover from that. In fact, you know, it may take longer than 48 hours, but we don't have that much time in a week. So, you know, um, for those, because I see a few questions coming through with different people on, uh, on variations and how would you fit it into this type of week or, or that type of week. I th for me, the, the first principle would be to work out when you're going to do your contact training in a week and how far can you get that away from your uh, your match exposure so that you, it's it's kind of like uh, in uh, in weightlifting they used to do the old three-day split you, you try and keep those those stimulus as far away from each other as possible so that uh, you can get maximum recovery from that and then you build the other other sessions in around that um but hopefully that'll uh, become clearer as you move on to, on to your next slide. I also think, Jason, I think we, at this stage, I think we have to become a bit more individual. So if you have a player who's had a high volume of contact, who is fatigued and your markers are telling you this, I would be then reluctant to throw them back in on the Tuesday uh, or control it or reduce it. So I think it become, I, I definitely don't think it's a one size fits all. And we, we have to base it around the individual. And you know who those individuals are, whether it be a back rower who's made 25 tackles in the match and you know he's mentally and physically fatigued and he hasn't recovered. Those older players that you might have in your team, they might, they might need extra time to recover. So they might actually do, well, hold on, we only played on Saturday. He's already done that contact for the week. So we can actually drop those training, 
that that part of the training session for that particular individual if if that makes sense jason yeah yeah agreed yeah. Um, Um, again, the complete rest comes after the match. In terms of the Monday, so we are still looking at doing um, sub-max intensity sort of work. That can be gym-based. However, some of that training session might feature in the Tuesday training session. So it might be part of the warm-up. It might be a 15-minute or a 10-minute part of the warm-up where you can incorporate what, what is in the last model on the Monday or depending on, on, on what the structure is or what you, what you have which, within your club, I would probably look at, at moving to a gym-based program. Jason? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, you know, we, we're, like I say, we, we time poor, but uh, we want the fittest players we can have. So yeah. whatever, whatever training stimulus we can get into them, we should get into them. So again, Wednesday becomes a complete, a complete rest after the contacts of, of the night before. And then we're into that speed part of that, of that particular Thursday, where we are then thinking of the Friday session inching in. So you are on that team run last 10 minutes of training sort of activity, but you are looking to increase the speed. The players should be rested um, from that Saturday. So that is how that model will work for that, choose, for that Tuesday, Thursday night. Jason. Yeah, so um, really what this part of the, the presentation is about is, is we've been talking about how to try and get these, these different stimulus into, into players. Um, and so what this now comes down to is, is the nuts and bolts of, of how do we actually do it? What, um, how do you plan your session? What, what things, what constraints can you, can you imply or impose on the game? To create these changes, um, and you know, this is probably just a, a useful checklist for coaches. I'm sure most coaches are, are using some or all of these. Um, but if we want to to try and influence these these different different demands of the game, um, and I'm talking not just physical here, but but uh, tactical also. And, and Mike, jump in uh, when whenever you you feel you need to. Um, you know, the, the things we can do is, is have a look at game constraints, things like numbers in the ruck. You know, if we need to create more, more space uh, to create more opportunity for, for attack, and that may in fact lead to more high-speed running because the attackers are breaking the line more often. You know, we can do that by forcing the defense to put five in a ruck and, and the attack only has to put one. Um, we can talk about different ruck and tackle behaviors. Do you... Do you have to go down to the floor? Do you have to go to a knee? Do you have to hold people into the rack? Or can we just touch each other with two hands and get back into, into play? That, create, that changes the game situation. Contact level. You know, are, we, are we just grabbing and holding or are we smashing each other? Um, <laughs> obviously, we're, we're with proper warm-ups and, and under the, the correct conditions. Um, Affecting things like player numbers. Are we overloading the the attack? Are we overloading the the, the defense? You know, overloading the attack, giving them more numbers, creates more opportunities for them, and makes the defenders run uh, hell for leather. On the other hand, if you want uh, if you want people to make tackles, just you know, don't give the attackers as much numbers. That you know, they don't have any space. They've got nowhere to go to, so they just have to keep running into defenders over and over again, and that's that grows our uh, collision demands. Um, we can shrink or increase the size of, of the field to put players closer together and increase collision or um, create more space to, to influence running. Um, where they're playing on the field, you know, um, when you start attacking in the, in the 22, the, you know, there's no backfield to worry about, so the defense tends to get up a lot close on you, whereas if you're attacking from you know, your, the halfway line, there's more space to defend, and, and so that changes the, the constraints also. Um, a really powerful stimulus here, and, and we got, it on, got onto it a bit before, is how much ball in play time versus how much recovery time. If you, if you want to get that, that volume type stimulus, if you want to, to uh, get the guys' heart rates up and, and get them working and sweating, you probably want the ball in play more. But if you want to emphasize high-speed running, if you want to emphasize um, execution, you know, 
uh, you you said earlier, Brett, that uh, most most teams score within four phases, or else they don't score at all. So you know, if we're talking about short ball in play times and saying, well, this is your opportunity to execute, we're going to give you some some chances, and and you need to go and score. That that plays within to within that sort of short ball in play time type of scenario. And then you know, the last thing to to talk about is just thinking whatever constraints that you you put on the game. The way the coach behaves also changes uh, changes uh, the levels of pressure, the mental attunement of the players, things like that. You know, if we're if we're in a in a learning phase and and the coach is saying, well, you know, that's all right, boys, you've you've dropped the ball for the 19th time in a row, but it's okay. We we're learning, we're building towards something. That's very different from an execution type session where where the coach is going to start losing his rag if things aren't happening the way they they need to. And that's also important because, you know, in the game, you've got to score when you've got to score. So, um, you know, putting that pressure and, and uh, creating the, that mental environment where you, where you have to score at this opportunity is also useful at times. Uh, Mark, <laughs> I ran through the whole list, but do you want to jump in there? No, I think, I think it's quite a nice time to go on to the next slide, which is you've presented pretty much all the considerations that a coach has to go through when they're designing their practice. And it's a bit of a minefield, to be honest. We're, we're proposing an, a, a holistic approach to developing a tactical model, whilst also considering the psychological, the physical, and the technical capabilities that are required. And I think uh, I, I see a lot of um, a lot of things thrown around on Twitter around. I've got this really good game, or like this really good game that we're going to use. And I, I think it's great that we're using game-based practice, but. I would start a step before, and I'm a massive advocate. Uh, he's a colleague of mine, of Bob Muir, and the coach, coach plan and reflective framework. Because again, it, it starts with the end in mind. It's that Steve Covey idea. What are we actually trying to achieve here? And what I mean by that is, if we can, if we can start to think in game moments or game problems, then our session objective or learning objective or outcome for that session can be centralized around that particular game moment or that particular principle. And then we start to consider what capabilities start to fall under that. And then what, what is required within that practice to allow improvements to occur. Um, I'm just going to attach on to Baum's characteristics of learning outcomes here. And he talks about it being active, attractive, appropriate, attainable. And if we've gone through the right process and coming up with an appropriate game model, they should tick all those boxes anyway. But the two I want to focus on are being measurable and visible. Uh, and I think this is really going to challenge some uh, a coach's bias, basically, because sometimes, me included, we can look at a session and we think that session's been successful because one player's just done, done something amazingly well. How often do we actually go about setting up a measurable learning outcome that we come back to at the end and actually have a tangible measure of success. And also, when we start with the end in mind, we can design a practice, as Brett showed before with those videos, and we can also plan for specific interactions. Uh, some, some people may have been on Ed Hall's uh, webinar earlier this year, and he spoke about that we need to plan for interactions with players, and I think that's really important through our coach behaviours. Um, and I just think this is a really nice idea. Start with the game moment then consider what you really want to achieve within that game moment or that performance problem, and then design the practice and plan for behaviours to allow the players to then engage with those objectives as well. Guys, just to, to, to jump in with some questions there. Um, thank you for Mike, and that's a, a really good tool to use and almost embed it in actually a, a, a planning framework that you, you, might, um, you might use per, prior to uh, planning your sessions. We've had lots of questions coming around, um, I guess flipping back to some of those, um, if we can go back to the previous slide, Brett, if that's okay. Brett, you're doing a fantastic job there. Thank you, sorry, as a, as a slide master. Um, just in terms, and we, Jason, you spoke about recovery time, but there's been some questions that have come in, I guess more so on the actual recovery of, of players, whether we're coaching once a week or, or three times a week plus a game. Um, so if we could just maybe answer some of those. Um, one is around the amount of contact and, and when we talk about contact, what's the definition of that? Does it always have to be full contact um, to develop the technical demands of the game? Um, and then 
secondly around how might we begin to to measure fatigue uh post session what sort of tools have, have you come across to 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 use that yeah i mean i think the um the contact content i mean content contact one is um is a challenge and what we've got to realize is that with players playing at at different levels uh we've got to think about what's our role there are we um are we trying to develop them or are we just trying to to get them ready for for the following week and and brett made a really important point because you know if you're an international loose forward and you've just made 15 or 16 tackles and you've carried the ball into contact 10 10 times and you've hit 15 rucks you've probably gotten enough contact in your in your life for that week you know um on the other hand if you're a schoolboy player and uh you know, potentially you've come off the bench or maybe you have play, played the whole game, but you've, you've made eight tackles in the game, you know, and you've got uh, you know, aspirations to play at a, at a higher level, you know, you've got to improve that, uh, that part of your game somewhere. And we don't improve without, without practicing. So, you know, it's context specific. Um, I saw one of the comments come, came through and said uh, that the, the England team um, – take two days off after the game. I, that's actually quite com, common in a lot of international teams. But, you know, these guys are, are at the pinnacle of, uh, of rugby and, and it's, it's war out there. It's attrition. I'm, I'm not surprised it takes them two days to, uh, to recover. Um, you know, so this is, this is a guideline. It's, it's, a, it's a tool. You know, no one's saying that you, um, you know, go, go and plan, plan your week exactly like this. I think the um, the more important thing is to realize that you know the the game presents some physical challenges. One of those is we know that expressions of maximal speed usually make the difference. Okay, so if you're not getting an opportunity to sprint maximally in a week, you're not getting better at that aspect of your game. And we know that the ability to to dominate collisions, um, to tackle well, things like that are are also very important for the game. So we we've got to find places in our week where we can overload the, those aspects so that we can develop in them. I think for me, just on the tackle, I think it's a really important part of training is that one, we need to prevent injury and two, we need to like embrace variability in training activities. So whilst we need to match or have surplus of game demands, we also need to consider the different nature of tackles that are occurring. So that that also has a massive impact on our practice design. So if we if we use a narrow pitch and we're only doing five v five, but the emphasis is on our tackle, the likelihood is the majority of those tackles are going to be front on, which might not be good for an outside back. So it, all I'm saying is that we need to embrace the variability in our practice design to ensure that we're meeting the demands positionally as well as collectively. Thanks for that. And just sort of, I guess this is a really uh, uh, one that summarises that contact issue. Um, uh, one of the, uh, the um, under, this is, I, I might change my name to this anonymous attendee. I think that would be a, a great name to, to have. Um, talks about how um, a coach who used to, um, who used to coach one of his high level under 20 side, but where they wouldn't have contact um, and would only do contact. Uh, on break weeks where they had no game coming up and uh, he or she suggests that the, the injury rate for the season was very low and they had a very successful year. I mean, how much would you agree or disagree with, with that, that approach? Yeah. I mean, it's, again, it's, it's contextual. Um, I think that one of the, the things we've got to consider is that, there are very long seasons in a, in a lot of places these days. I mean, Mike coaching, uh, coaching Harrogate, what's your season? About 32 games? Um, uh, 26, I believe. 26 in total. Okay. 20, so, you know, guys are playing for a, for a very, very long period of, of time. So it's quite, it's quite possible, you know, if you've got a relatively short season to, to not attend to these things. But, you know, when you start getting into this, this week in, week out, you know, I, for me, I don't believe you can go 26 weeks without addressing your, your tackle and your contact technique. I don't think that you, you're developing players like that. 
um, you know, maybe you've got a couple of bye weeks in, in there and you, you can have a go. But I think it's, it's you know, if we, if we want players to get better, we've got to give them exposure to situations they can get better in. Um, and we can't guarantee that that's going to happen in, in the match every week. So, you know, if a, if a person's got a, got a skill deficiency or an area they need to improve, our job as coaches is to create that opportunity. Thanks, Jason. And just sorry, some of the questions that came through earlier around um, how we might um, uh, measure fatigue post-session as well. I know um, uh, for those who maybe don't have GPS, RPE is a, a fairly simple tool to use. I know there's now recommendations that you make measure internal and external load. So you, you would measure RPE for, for the, the question reads heart and lungs and then for, for muscular load as well. So that might be one um, way to look at it, bearing in mind that there is, I think there's some evidence there around how um, people's perceptions and, and uh, of their own score, there needs to be some training um, uh, to allow them to equate what a seven is. Um, or, or, or a five is so um, that that's a fairly simple tool that can be used um, for, for those working in schools and clubs who maybe don't have access to, to the GPS um, guys I know we're coming towards the end so should we, um, uh, should we complete the, the presentation then we'll, we'll open up to uh, some final questions I'm conscious of um, that we're uh, oh there it is there it is the end I, uh, the pre-planning the slides I have have an <laughs> slide in between but we've taken that out um well there it is so uh we, we will finish there um one thing we didn't cover actually and and i know mike we spoke about it in our previous um presentation was tactical periodization is a is a holistic approach um and we touched upon some of the psychological skills that we might embed and i know there's been a few questions that have come around that um we almost have to have our, about four or five different hats on as a coach um, and I know we briefly spoke about the, the psychological characteristics for developing excellence PCDs is a, a possible tool or, or, or an approach that we might use embedded within the tactical periodization approach just uh, in, in terms of some of the questions that have come through on this is there can we give us one example um, and Brett and Jason feel free to jump in of, of how we might embed some psychological skills within within our, our training uh, design yeah, by all means. I guess um, psychological skills, characteristics, uh, they, they, they are quite relative to particular moments of the game. You would align things like resilience to goal line defence or um, goal setting at half time or in, or in group discussions. And I think you can be really clever and quite, um, quite deliberate in the way you can target specific psychological skills. So for example, I'd use self-monitoring or self-evaluation and control, which uh, would cut across both self-regulation and PCD, so realistic performance evaluation. So I might set an objective for a session where I want us to have, uh, we've got an overload in attack, we're playing off 10, and I want us to achieve 80% success rate of choosing the right option and then executing the right pass. So we go through the session, we have someone with a pen and paper or an analyst if we've, got, if we've got that exposure and we simply tally up how many attempts, how many successful, how many fail. And then from a realistic performance evaluation point of view, pick out a player, how many, what success rate do you reckon we're at? And then all of a sudden you can, so they're starting to give you their expectations of what the session looks like. And then you provide a realistic evaluation of it for them. Now, little things like that can really reinforce what, what does real look like? What does performance actually look like here? That's great, Mike. Thank you for that. Have you anything to add to that, Jason and Brett? No. <laughs> no, I'm afraid not. Okay, no, no worries. Thank you for that. Um, I'm, I'm really conscious of the time with 90, 90 minutes. Now that's a game of football, not rugby. So I'm, I'm really happy. I'm comfortable with that, that duration. Um, so we, we will um, begin to close down the, the, the webinar now. If there are any more questions, we'll, we'll, we'll take a few more, but if there are any more questions, if you could send them through now. Um, just, I just want to reiterate that we've got a really diverse um, uh, 
group of people watching this. So again, if we're looking at that that training of a, an amateur team, maybe training once or twice a week, what, what would what would your some real take home messages uh, be for the um, for those coaches? After you guys, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. For for me, we've got to understand as a coach and and as players, and whether we're going to educate the players or, or they they might tell you to understand what the actual game is. So I would I would be looking at at looking at tactical periodization in around that 15, 16 age group um, where you can have those conversations and you can get that understanding about what the physical, mental, tactical, technical point is about the game. But um, I think for, for the coach, the take home is we have got to understand what the game actually is and whether it be how many decisions they're making or whether it be how much they run and um, that intermittent part of the game that I spoke about. But if they could take away like each game is different. Like we have presented a model, we've presented data around it, but there's actually no fixed point with any of the, this research. So like sometimes the players will run seven and a half K. Sometimes the, the following week, they could do five and a half K. Um, they might have 10 tackles one week. They might make one the following week. So I think the nature of our game, it's, it's not like the long jump where you, you just start at a, at a particular point, hit a board and jump and then you're done. It's there's so much more to it. We we don't have that that part. It's it's it is chaotic at times, um, and and we've got to prepare our players for that for those moments. Yeah, Jason, I'm, I'm I'm just add add to that. You you're absolutely right. Understand the game, but the the biggest outcome for anything that we're trying to do is get better at rugby. Don't don't try and get people better at high speed running. Don't try and make them fitter, make them better rugby players. You know, that's when that becomes the overarching aim, then all the other pieces of the puzzle tend to fall into place. Yeah, and I think lastly for me, um, I guess it's all a process for me. Start with the end in mind through some broad expectations of a game model, shape intentions on a session by session basis, and then reflect on the reality through measurable outcomes. Thank you, Mike. Um, and I'm going to do one more because we're into we're into added on time and we're allowed added on time. And I think this is probably the situation. I'm I'm really conscious of the irony uh, that we we are trying to support coaches during this time. And I think Menster, um, St Mary's, and, and you guys for giving up with time have been really good. But the irony is that we're doing it in this forum rather than out on the pitch. So um, but I guess uh, that's the constraints we're living in at the moment. Um, if I'm thinking now, let's hope we get back to contact sport, depending on where we are, August, September time. Uh, and um, this is a specific question from Glenn Howitson. Uh, how would we use a tactical periodization approach within pre-season? Um, so would we be pragmatic and focus on maybe specific physical qualities um, in each session? Or would we have more rounded a, a, a approach? Um, and maybe to looking at more of a community rugby setting where we've only got two or three sessions per week during that pre-season. One thing I, I don't think we have touched upon in this is the idea that solutions can be quite original and quite creative. And I think pre-season is the time to really see if those things are pragmatic. So what I mean by that is when you watch the higher levels of the game, everyone seems to play in a similar way, but the rules allow different ways of playing. So if you can come up with original tactical solutions and use pre-season as a target to achieve those, I think it's a really good attempt at trying to solve rugby in your own way. Any thoughts on pre-season, Brett and Jason, using adopting this, this tactical periodization approach? I mean, I think that tactical periodization certainly fits in very well, as I said earlier, with these extended in season periods um you know there's there's no particular reason why you can't use it um in the pre-season but you you've got less constraints because you you don't have to get ready for a game every week so i mean most most periodization models uh progress from general to specific right um and i'd say that what we've been talking about to today is some highly specific forms of training so 
you know, is there is there a reason not to do some you know some very specific speed work in the in the preseason? I I don't think so. Um, at the same time, is there any particular benefit to to getting guys fit by making them go go on a five k jog? No, that's probably not going to make them any better at catching or passing or or seeing what defenders are doing. So, you know, I'd I'd probably again use some of these principles, but um, you know, there's like I say, there's there's a lot more degrees of freedom in a in a preseason. But you know, ultimately, you you want to make uh, you know the tactical outcomes your your overall driver so you, you want to go down there knowing what aspect of the game you want to get better at each preseason session yeah jason i think you've hit the nail on the head there i think if if there's aspects of your game that that you need to work on so if you're if you want to make the best passing team in the world come up with a game and an activity that involves a lot of passing that can improve that technique of passing that the decision making around the passing and, and be creative. What, what I think this um, model does, it, it allows us as coaches a freedom to to uh, to put your philosophy there and, and and let the players play and and whatever area you want to work on, you have freedom to work with. But this can definitely be worked in that preseason model, without doubt. Brilliant. Um, I think we will uh, end this webinar on that. No, um, just to say thank you for everyone who's um, who's tuned in uh, wherever you are in this world. I, I hope I hope you're all safe um, and and staying healthy. Um, good luck when the season um, begins. Um, I'd like to also express thanks to Mike, Brett, um, Jason for an absolutely outstanding presentation. Um, thank you very much for giving up your time uh, and your evenings to to present this work. Um, thanks to um, uh, the Invisible Man, Simon Rogg uh, from St. Mary's, who's been uh, the Zoom webinar master during this um, during this webinar, making sure everything's running smoothly. So thank you to him uh, and my colleague Tom Hounce, who, who has I think is somewhere here, but who's disappeared as well. Um, I got told off for not not introducing him, so. Um, uh, I hope that's uh, uh, got me out of a sticky patch. Um, and just to thank you to to Leinster Rugby, um, the work that goes on in Leinster is um, is phenomenal in terms of not only their player development, but how that their support and love for the game, um, and how they support and continue to to support coach learning and um, and development uh, as well as uh, the obvious player development pathways and the successful player development pathways that they have. Um, so thank you to Sue Leinster for allowing uh, this to happen uh, as well. I should probably also say the fact that I work for them as well, St. Mary's University. Um, the interaction on social media has been brilliant tonight. Uh, once um, uh, this is all finished, we'll maybe continue that some of those conversations on using the, um, the hashtag. Um, if you can go the hashtag has been retweeted um, and the handle using uh, the site of St. Mary's Rugby Coaching. Um, so if you have a look at that, uh, you'll be able to get um, uh, some additional information from the webinar tonight. The slides and webinar will um, go out as well. So they'll be made available on the Leinster website. Um, as well as the St. Mary's Rugby MSC um, uh, Twitter feed. Um, and finally, just to a message uh, for the Leinster coaches, um, if they've got any developmental needs, um, any learning needs, um, please uh, get in contact with your uh, CDO um, uh, for any 